Worship is the way that the battle is won. This is the way that we fight. We're praising for the victory. I just can't. of God today. I'm thankful for the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I've made up my mind. Now is not the time to quit. I'm not going to give up now. I've come too far to turn back now. Thank you, Brother Cannon, confirming what I'm feeling in the Holy Ghost to preach about today. I like there's In that first part of that song, we talked about blessing the Lord. He is our soon coming king. This is not just some figment of our imagination that says it's just going to happen way out there in the yonder somewhere. But if you know your Bible, you know he's coming again soon. And that the signs of the times are showing us we are living in what I would call the last of the last days. The Lord is coming very, very soon. We are turning to Titus chapter 2. So good to have you in the house of the Lord today. We do have Brother Edward, Sister Annette, both sick today. Also, um, Brother Seton on vacation. And then the Whites called me early this morning, talked to them. Uh, Sue White, been on the prayer list uh, for some time here. She's been in the hospital. They have, I believe she's in the hospital. I better not misspeak there. Um, I believe they told me she was in St. Francis, if I'm not mistaken, this morning. Um, And uh, we had been praying that we would receive a good report. We didn't receive the report we wanted. Um, There is cancer in three different areas of Sue's body. Very, very sick lady today. And so the whites are just concerned. They didn't want something to happen if she was to pass away and them not make at least one trip up to see her. Some family had called them late yesterday and told them, uh, you might want to come and see Sue. And so that's where they are this morning, heading toward, I believe it's Memphis, and uh, going to go and see her this morning. It's not like them to miss, and I know uh, many of you probably wonder where they are today. And so they're visiting a family member, not sure if they'll be uh, able to be with us tonight or not. It's good to see Sister Linda Alley. I know it's been a while since she's been able to be in service with us. It's good to have her uh, back with us today. Been in a lot of pain and still in quite a bit of pain but appreciate her coming on to church today uh, also it's good to see the Browns with us this morning and uh, I know uh, dad sent me a text this morning and said they were praying for the services today I know he is preaching at Life Bridge a church that has church every Sunday in a gymnasium 
they load the chairs and, and they unload the chairs out of a trailer, set up and have church, and then they load everything back up into a trailer after church. And so dad is preaching at a it's a high school gymnasium this afternoon for one of our North American mission churches in the Nashville area. And uh, he always does a good job of letting me know when they're preaching somewhere. I know they, they like to be here as much as possible and uh, recently, it's not been as much as anybody would like, but at the same time, we understand they're even in the middle of transition, uh, even there. says they still will attend here as much as they can, but obviously being all the way in Dixon, that will make things a little more difficult. Titus chapter 2, and verse number 11. Uh, I want to say one more time, thank you to everybody. They may have already said it today, and uh, with all the events that happened yesterday, I was running late this morning getting my notes done, and uh, but... We had, I know, at least 200 come through yesterday in a great event. And I want to say thank you. If I start calling names, I'm going to miss somebody because there's people that just jumped in, started cleaning, jumped in, served food. Uh, When I walked in that fellowship hall, you know, at first we thought, there ain't that many that's going to stay and eat. We're going to have a lot of food left over. But when I walked in that fellowship hall and I saw people standing, people sitting around just in chairs around the wall, I thought, oh, dear Lord, how are we going to get all these people food in a quick matter of time? But people pitched in. Uh, thank you to those that organized the different events. We're going to have a video Wednesday night kind of showing you what took place. And uh, the winner of the contest between the trunks and all of that will be announced also as well. Just going to make a big deal out of it because it is a big deal. We reached into our community in ways that I don't think we've ever done before and it excited about where this is going to take us. Let's go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 today, and I'll tell you what, I'm going to read from the screen to save us some time. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Verse number 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. We should live righteously. We need to live godly in this present world. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Brother Dylan, remember that verse 13, because I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Last verse, verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. We live in an unprecedented time of wickedness today where church, yes, it's more popular than it used to be, but there's also more people today that are scoffing at the church and looking at things that the church stands for and says, well, that's old fashioned or that's outdated. We got to remember there are certain core principles of this truth that we got to still make sure that the community knows that we believe and that we practice we're going through holiness and that kind of thing one of the things i'm going to talk about today that is dropped into my spirit and uh, i do believe the lord is leading us this morning as i said song talking about the soon coming king we need to never lose sight of the fact that the lord is coming again for his people and that helps us to understand that what i'm going through right now is just a temporary thing but that There is an eternal hope and glory. Go back to verse number 13, and we're going to focus on one sentence in that passage. Looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope. With the help of the Holy Ghost today, I want to speak to you on the subject, the greatest hope in the church. The greatest hope in the church. It's it's not what you might think. It's actually the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the greatest hope. He says, you need to be able to give an answer of the hope that is in you. What is that hope? It's hope of a better day. We're not just living for this nation. I'm going to a new Jerusalem. I'm going somewhere where all of the imperfections are not going to be able to enter in those gates. It's going to be a perfect place, a paradise. And so today we want to talk about heaven just a little while. Let's ask the Lord to bless. Lord Jesus... We need you, Lord, to work in this house today. God, I'm believing and expecting, God, you to work, Lord, and move through your word. I ask today, oh Lord God, that you... Praise God. Thank you so much. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. Something I became aware of, I was uh, privileged to uh, have some uh, media sit up in the box with me. I went Friday night. 
I was glad I was inside Friday night. Friday night was rainy and, and uh, cool. It, was, it wasn't just cold. I wouldn't say cold. We hadn't seen cold yet. We wait till December and January gets here. You might have thought you got cold on the hayride last night, but cold weather's coming. Uh, that was cool. And, uh, but, however... Uh, I, I, was, I was privileged. I went up, and, man, I thought I was really privileged at first. I walked in the door of the press box Friday night, and, man, it was a real nice big press box, about five windows. And I said, uh, hey, I'm with Good News Radio. They said I was supposed to come. He said, oh, you're across the hall. I thought, oh, man, what are they going to put us in, you know. And, and, uh, but it was nice as well, about three windows. And, and uh, so I started looking in about 15 minutes till game time. I'm, I'm the only one in this Three window press box, and Seton is at a uh, a wedding uh, rehearsal dinner, and he wasn't able to go with me. He normally goes and helps me and keeps me company and talks to me throughout the game and helps me throughout the night. And uh, he wasn't with me, and I'm sitting there kind of, man, this is gonna be a long night. I'm up here by myself, and so I started texting. I text the uh, Humboldt Chronicle. Uh, person that goes and writes the article said, hey, you don't have to sit over there in them cold stands. I got chairs up here. Come, on. I just want somebody to come up there and talk to me. I was going to be bored all night. And uh, so I, I began to talk to some newspaper people and something that I had never known before. Um, did you know that newspapers have a certain size font that is only used for mega events? In other words, when there's a big earthquake, They've got a certain font, Brother AC, they go to every time. If there's a big nation announcement from the president or whatever, there's a certain font they're going to use every single time. Anybody know what it's called? Second coming type. They go to this same font every single time. It was, a, it was used to announce the bombing of the Pearl Harbor. Second coming type was used to announce the assassination of JFK. It was used on September 12, 2001 after the Muslim terrorist attacks on America. This font is so large, the words jump off the page and literally say, read me. It's interesting they don't call it major events type or breaking news type. They call it second coming type. Why? Because there is no greater event that will ever occur in our world that will come close to the headlines of the newspaper the next day that will say, the church is missing. With all of my heart, I believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And there are many people who will repudiate this idea today. The apostle Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, he says, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Do y'all remember it wasn't too long ago? Now, now these goons went out there and tried to put a day that the Lord was coming back. Now I think that's just as ignorant as people that don't believe he's coming back again anytime. But they put this, they put this date out there. Do y'all remember what NBC News and some of these news outlets were sharing pictures on Facebook and making fun and they had went outside their studios and dropped clothes in the street and said, uh-oh, somebody's missing and they were making fun of it. You think that's something, you just wait. In our day, there, it's going to get more and more. There are people that are saying, where is the promise of this coming? Is Jesus really coming back? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things uh, continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And so there are those who mock and who scoff at the idea of the second coming of Christ. The fastest growing religion group of our time is those who will check the box next to the word none on national surveys. The nuns, N-O-N-E-S, are those who have no religion. The atheists, the agnostics. In America, in America the latest that I could find was in 2016. The latest uh, statistics show that it has now grown to 23% of the population in America claiming to have no religion. This represents a seismic shift in our culture. James Emery White has written a book titled The Rise of the Nuns. The widespread acceptance of the Darwinian evolution accompanied by atheism and agnosticism is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy and it is evidence of the divine origin of scripture in that it itself is proof that Jesus is coming again. I want to remind us on this Sunday morning at Harvest Church, the second coming is one of the emphatic doctrines of 
of our Bible. It is mentioned and referred to in the New Testament more than 350 times. Yet I am sure that we probably don't give the proper amount of attention to this subject in our preaching or even our daily Bible study. But Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 16, The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. This old world will grind on as always with all of its rebellion. All the programs that men have set in motion to produce the utopia for our age will proceed in precision. The great orbits through the, uh, throughout the constellations of the universe will move on and they will spin as they have done since the dawn of creation. A student will still be studying and burning the midnight oil, if you will. The businessman, the Bible says, will still buy and will still sell. The housewife will be busy about her daily chores. Yes, Everything will be the same when suddenly he will come. I believe one of the greatest truths of the Bible is the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. I preach holiness, yes. I preach the new birth, yes. But why? Because I know from the fulfillment of prophecy in the word of God that are happening right before our very eyes that we don't have years upon years before he returns but that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Come on somebody if you don't have the Holy Ghost you ought not put it off you need it today if your heart is not right with God you need to find a place at an altar today why because Jesus is coming soon our text urges us to be constantly looking for that blessed hope that's why I wanted you to focus on the beginning of that scripture notice the word hope for just a moment That word in the New Testament does not suggest something that is elusive or mythical like I hope this happens. But rather it is something that is vital and real and is anticipated. I say to you with certainty and authority on this Sunday morning, Jesus Christ is coming again. I feel that one of the greatest tragedies of the modern day church is we hold on to this second coming of Christ as a doctrine, but we have lost it as our hope. Because we don't live like he's coming soon. We don't act like he's coming soon. We'd check our spirit a little more if we believed he was coming soon, Brother Steve. We'd check our actions a little bit more if we believed he was coming soon. It's interesting as I read all the way from Matthew to Revelation. It isn't so much death that we are to anticipate. It isn't so much even heaven that we're looking forward to. That which is set before the believer in the church is the coming again of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For again and again, we are exhorted to love his appearing. Look at your neighbor and tell him, say, he's coming. This is the certainty of the hope, or this is the greatest hope in the church. For every prophecy on the first coming of Jesus, there are eight other prophecies concerning his second coming. The second coming of Jesus was predicted by the prophets. It was promised by the Savior, and it was preached by the apostles. And we would do well to build our lives around the belief, the truth, and the fact that he's coming again soon. Why? Because I promise you, when you think that way, it'll change the way we live. We won't talk the way we used to talk. It'll change what we value value and how we prioritize life. I hope to God we get it in our heart and in our spirit that the Lord could come at any moment and on any day. He said like a thief in the night, he's going to come back for his church. And the point of the matter is I want to be ready. Somebody say I want to be ready. A Bible believing preacher brought a tremendous sermon on the second coming. When he had finished, one of those liberal preachers, one of those rose water squirting preachers, you know, weak need preachers, got cotton string for a backbone. You know, those preachers that start nowhere and they end at the same place. I've watched some of those sermons be like, dear God, how do they sit through that? He came up to me and said, I want you to know I can't get what you just preached out of the New Testament. Well, as old preacher said, you sure can't, buddy. It wasn't meant to be taken out. It's meant to be preached. Ever since the ascension of Jesus Christ, Christians have been challenged to live with the blessed hope that our God is coming again. 
Many scripture references have been given to us to feed this hope. One of the primary references is found in the promise given to the apostles at the time of the ascension. Luke would write in Acts 1 and 11 that there were two men who were there on the scene clothed in white apparel, presumably angels, and they said, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. The scriptures from Genesis to Revelation tell us that he's coming audibly, visibly, personally, and imminently. The scripture does not say when he's coming. But if the Bible speaks with more emphasis about any one thing more than another, it is the certainty that Jesus Christ is coming again. Revelation 1 and 7, the Bible says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. If the certainty of his coming is bound up in that word hope. Would you throw that verse 13 back up of my text? We're going to do this a lot, Brother uh, Dylan. Verse 13 of Titus 2. Look at that. Looking for that blessed hope. If the certainty is wrapped up in that word hope, the character of his coming is wrapped up in that word blessed. A blessed hope. Or a happy hope. As I prepared this message and as I prepared myself to present this message, I asked myself, will his coming really be a happy hope? Will his coming be a happy hope for me or a blessed hope? In order for it to be a blessed hope for us, ladies and gentlemen, three things have to be true. First of all, it has to be a happy rapture. Now, I know the word rapture does not appear in the New Testament, but the concept occurs over and over again. It means a catching away. Listen to what Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be raptured or caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Listen, Jesus gives us a very vivid portrayal of how it will be when the redeemed of the Lord are caught away to meet him in the air. In Matthew 24, the Bible would give us another uh, kind of glimpse into what is happening here. He says, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until that day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. And then he says, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. He said, two women shall be grinding at the meal, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. In a similar passage in Luke 17, Brother Dylan, I'm not going to go there and read it tonight, but I will, or today rather, but I will give us an idea of what it says just for the sake of time today. It mentions there will be two in bed at night, two women then grinding together in the early morning, and then two men together in the field at midday. When I began to look at that this week, Brother Cannon, I began to notice we know that Jesus is going to come quickly in the twinkling of an eye as suddenly as the lightning from the east to the west. But then I began to notice it may be early morning in some parts of the earth. It'll be in the midst of a working day in other parts of the earth. And then it may be in the middle of the night where other people are. It's not talking about three different raptures. It's talking about the same rapture of the church. Now, isn't that amazing? Brother Andrew, long before Galileo, long before Columbus, the Bible knew this world was round. Well, I just crossed some theology right there. I didn't know I had some flat earthers here, but anyway. <laughs> Let me get back. Jesus is coming again soon. <laughs> He said it's, it's going to be different times for different people as far as in, in their, their watch, but it's going to be the same time with the Lord's time. Now, Jesus coming again to this earth, and, and I'm going to tell you, friends, it, it's either going to be the most thrilling moment in the history of your life or it's going to be the most tragic moment. 
the most awful, heart-rending moment? Is it going to be a happy, blessed hope for you? Is it going to be a blessed hope? Or will you rise with the redeemed into glory? Or will you be left behind in this world of sin and sorrow and trials and tribulations? If Christ were to break through from heaven to rapture his church, his redeemed people, his blood-bought people, his spirit indwelt people today, would you be able to look him in the eye and shout, Hallelujah, I'm going home? Or would you be left with a horror and the hellishness of a world ruled by the Antichrist, the beast, and the devil? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm looking for a happy rapture. This blessed hope suggests for the Christian not only a happy rapture, but also a happy review. Now, that word review is suggested by Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 when he says we must all appear for review before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that's interesting. Um, He says that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he's done, whether it is good or bad. The Christian will stand before the Bema, which is the judgment seat of Christ. This is mentioned in Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5. It's mentioned in all three of those passages. The judgment seat of Christ is for the believer here. One day, every believer, every child of God is still going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're not going to be judged there at that moment as sinners. We're going to be judged as servants. Now, this is what began to kind of stand out to me. I want to point out that he says, in your body, what you've done, there you're going to be judged. Now, we know there's going to be crowns that are going to be given out. To the degree that you have walked with God is going to become apparent on that day. I don't want to just get by. I want to tell you that it's going to be made evident whether or not you have lived before the Lord with everything that you have or you just tried to find out if you just could do enough. In our text, we're told that we're looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God. But while we're looking and while we're waiting, the scripture says we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 1 John 3, we're told that every man that has the hope of the second coming in his heart will purify himself even as he is pure. Let me tell you uh, how to have a good relationship with God. Walk with him in purity. In other words, set your affection on things above. Ask him to give you the mind of Christ. Abhor evil, love righteousness. Let the Spirit control your life. You can't do any of these things unless you're born again of water and of the Spirit. God is going to love us regardless. I understand that. His love is unconditional. But our sins do build up barriers between God and us, and it does affect our salvation. I I, I was teasing a, a, a man of another faith this morning on Facebook. And I was just kind of picking at him. We we joke around with each other all the time. And uh, I sent him a meme that I had found this morning. And it was talking about, you know, this once saved, always saved. And and I said, hey, does that mean that your your religion is is, uh, exempt from daylight savings time? You saved that hour last year. Once saved, always. We laughed together this morning early about that. I'm not preaching that today. I do believe you have to live godly in this present world. But I also believe there are rewards for those that make sacrifices as well that goes beyond just what I have to do to make it to heaven. See, we like to be seat warmers. Man, it's going to get quiet in here early. We like to be seat warmers. I'll check in Sunday morning, Sunday night. Don't ask me to do any more. My God, you want me to hand out candy to kids? Are you serious? (laughs) You want me to dress up and look a fool? Well, yeah. <laughs> Be honest. With you. There was people yesterday that told me, I like what I feel around this place. Now I did have somebody ask me, I wonder how many of them will come Sunday morning. You just missed the point. You just missed the point. Yesterday was not to make sure all 200 of them came here today. We got to grow in relationship with our communities. Because if the first time they meet me, Sister Rini is right here, I'm not going to get anywhere with them while they're there. But they had to know I'm a real person yesterday. Now, I had planned. In fact, I aggravated my wife yesterday because I had planned to wear my Harvest Church polo. And I got up here and just started working. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to do that today. And I just grabbed one of those pullovers. It was a sports team pullover and put it on. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to walk among them today and talk to them. They didn't know I was the pastor until I told them so. 
But you know what? I learned a lot about how they view us by doing that. And I learned a lot of good things about how they view us. This is a place where we have felt welcome. Yes, I'm glad you feel welcome here today. I'm the pastor of this church, and I'd love to see you again. You mean you pastor? Yes, I pastor here. And you think this is fun. You ought to come and spend some time with us on a regular basis. What what did we just do? We didn't compromise, no. We gave them a place to start. Every one of us had to find somewhere to start on this journey. Now, do I want them to stop with candy? No, because I can't afford that. I can't just keep putting... (laughs) Sister Casey wouldn't want to do that every Saturday, I can tell you. It's a lot of work. Even this morning, we're still cleaning up stuff this morning, just from things that just, it's easy to get left behind. There's candy stuck to the parking lot. I know it's aggravating, and you may step on a piece and carry it on the bottom of your shoe, but please don't let that make you begrudge trying to reach some souls yesterday. Why? Because it's easy for us to get caught in moments of the flesh that we forget the greatest hope of the church. Yes, I want them to be saved, and I want them to get into an altar. And we spent some time talking about fears and we spent some time talking about the Word of God around a campfire last night. We spent time with them riding and freezing ourselves to death on a hayride. We we did all kinds of things with them. But I'm going to tell you something. People that will sacrifice of their time, people that couldn't come and you you donated candy, I'm not down in that at all. We needed that. My Lord, we had to run to Walmart a second time. They hit us so hard in the first hour, I I had to send John to go get some more candy and ice because we was just, it was a great turnout. I don't begrudge anything that anybody was able to do. We've got to remember why we're here, and that is make sure that this community knows where they need to come when they decide that they need to make some changes in their life. I can't make anybody stop drinking until they want to stop. Eric, praise God for what he's doing. He's not done. We gave you a starting place in that journey. Eric meets with me every Thursday morning. See, every Thursday, every Thursday that I've been able to, we've missed a couple weeks. We did it again last Thursday. It's early in the morning. Eric got off work at 1 o'clock in the morning. He was up here at 7.45. There's rewards for stuff like that, Eric. I believe that. I believe that. But thank God, Eric decided. He said, I'm not going to drink anymore. I couldn't make him stop. But now I can help Eric once he's made up his mind. He's going to quit. See, there's things that's going on in our lives that we think, well, if such and such would happen, that would help me to quit. No, you've got to make up your mind. This is how it's going to happen. We have to give people starting places on the journey. Give you an idea. Everybody was headed to PK retreat. We were all going to end up at the same cabin. Wesley started three and a half hours ahead of me. Just because he started three and a half hours ahead of me didn't mean he made it to his destination before me. There was things that happened that would slow him down that would allow me to catch up. Here's what I'm saying. You may get in this journey at different places, but when we all get to heaven, he's not going to say, well, this line here is for 25 years or more, and this line here is for five years or more, and this line here is for however many days you was at. No. When we reach our destination, the Lord is going to say well done to us all. So no matter how many years you wasted, no matter how much time you wish you could get back, I want to encourage somebody today. Your greatest hope is the same greatest hope every other person has in this room, and that is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this relationship with God ought to get better every single day that you live it. Secondly, you're going to be judged in terms of your relationship to the church. Boy, boy. I want to tell you, there's a movement afoot that frightens me. And it's a movement that wants to demote the importance of the local church. The recent survey I could find on this one was 2014. And it revealed that although church involvement was once a cornerstone of American life, 51% of Christians in the U.S. and that were adults said it's not too or not all that important to get involved. They're coming, but that's all they're doing. There is an emphasis on the invisible church rather than the local church. There's millions of Christians in America who say they're a part of the invisible church, but they want nothing to do with the local church. 
But you know what something? Here's here's something. The invisible church has no organization, has no doctrine, has no discipleship, has no accountability, no fellowship, no pastor, no praise and worship, no sense of community, no significant influence in their community. I don't put much stock in the invisible church. And might I add, church attendance and church involvement is still important. I'm afraid a lot of parents are failing to teach their children the importance of the church. You say, well, how do you say that? Let's go to some travel softball fields today. How many kids are there and how many kids are in the churches of America this morning? You ought to be saying, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So while I'm preaching about the second coming of the Lord, I feel I need to remind us we're also going to be judged about our involvement with the local church. I repudiate the idea that God is finished with his church. The only thing that God's interested in here and now is his church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to tell you when the whole reviewing process is over, that which is going to be presented before the glory of the Father with exceeding joy, the Bible says without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, it's going to be the glorious church of the Almighty God. I love the church. Oh, it may have its weaknesses, it has its failures, it has its flaws because it's got people in it. But I want to tell you, I love the church. Jesus loved the church so much that he gave himself for it. I believe that every blood-bought child of God ought to get in a local Bible-believing, Christ-exalting church and be faithful and roll up their sleeves and say, where can I serve and where can I make a difference in the last few years? that we are here. There was a Methodist evangelist. His name was Sam Jones. He used, he used to conduct uh, what he called quitting meetings. Anybody heard of those? He'd come in and Steve, he'd, he'd preach on various sins. And then he'd say, all right, I want, I want people that you're going to quit this sin. I want you to stand. And maybe a man would stand and say, I've been drinking liquor for all these years, but I'm quitting. Another one might stand and say, I've been cussing and I'm going to quit. One of the greatest moments, though, Sam said, that happened in those meetings. He was in a meeting and this elderly lady stood up. Preacher, I ain't been doing nothing and I'm going to quit, she said. (laughs) What she meant was, I'm going to get up and start doing something for God. There's a lot of Christians who have been doing nothing. We need to quit. I'm not saying quit the church. I'm saying get busy. (laughs) We find our place of service and be busy until he comes. I'm going to tell you one thing the Lord has done for me, and that is he saved me from the love of an easy chair. While the Lord is away, he is coming back someday to see what I've done while he was gone with what he gave me. Remember the parable of the talents. Is he going to find us busy when he returns? I mean busy about the things of God and things that will last for eternity. You see, one day the Lord's going to judge you in relationship and how you related to the local church. I know there's a deep significance that I can't expound there this morning. The writer of Hebrews would say, Forsake not the assembly of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Then lastly, you're going to be judged on the basis of your relationship to the world. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. Teacher asked the student, Lord, if there is somebody that believes in flat earth, you're going to hate me before this service is over. This is just a joke, okay? Teacher asked the student, said, is the world round? No, ma'am. Is it flat? He said, no, (laughs) ma'am. Well, if it's not round and it's not flat, then what is it? He said, it's crooked. (laughs) He got that right. This place we live in is a crooked world. (laughs) Sermons on worldliness are rare today. The new world, secularism. They they say, the new word rather, secularism. Billy Sunday used to say that phrase, worldly Christian is a misnomer. He said, you might as well talk about a heavenly devil as much as you say a worldly Christian. You know what we are is what we are away from home. Now, I've known preachers that traveled away from home and acted like the devil himself. Here's a name you'll recognize. Vance Hadner, he used to say this. When Peter and John were let go, he said, we read that they went to their own company. And then he said, where do you go when you're let go? I thought, ooh. 
He said, I'd hate to track down some church members when they get several hundred miles away from home. And then he said, when Peter gets out of jail, where did he go when he was let go? He went to a prayer meeting. We gravitate to what lures us, and eventually it shows where our heart is. I got a whole bunch of old Leonard Ravenhill's books, and I can't read a bunch of chapters at a time, Brother Andrew, because, man, all that terminology they used back then we don't use now, and I have to read about a chapter, and I have to shut it, because then I'm like, I need to soak this in. I can't, you know, it's just a lot of stuff. He said, the true man of God is heart sick. Grieved at the worldliness of the church. Grieved at the toleration of sin in the church. Grieved at the prayerlessness in the church. He is disturbed that the corporate prayer of the church no longer pulls the strongholds down of the devil. That was Leonard Ravenhill years ago. But the question is this. When you stand before God and you're judged of those three things, personal relationship with God, relationship to your community, relationship to the world, he says, the question is this. Is it going to be a happy judgment? for us if I understand the meaning of 1 Corinthians 15 I understand that as one star differs from another in glory so in that celestial day after we've passed in review of the judgment seat of Christ we're going to be given places of responsibility in the kingdom of God I'm telling you that the places that we will occupy will reflect our faithfulness down here and you won't be able to change it there there's a story of the wealthy Christian who died and he went to heaven to meet the Lord and he met St. Peter at the golden gate and was ushered into heaven Peter said I'm going to show you around heaven for a little bit then I'm going to take you to your celestial home. They started down Hallelujah Avenue, and they came to this huge, beautiful mansion. The wealthy man said, now, St. Peter, who lives here? St. Peter said, this is the home that's built for Alfred, you know, your yard man, your gardener. The wealthy man thought, oh, Alfred, he's going to be flabbergasted to see the kind of house he's going to have up here. He won't believe it. This is incredible. St. Peter and the wealthy man turned the corner, and they went down Glory Boulevard, and there was another house. It, too, was a mansion beyond description. A magnificent dwelling place. The wealthy man said, now who lives here? He said, well, this is the home of Ralph, your barber. Ralph was always telling his customers about Jesus Christ, inviting them to church, and won a lot of people to the Lord. The wealthy man said, well, yes. As a matter of fact, Ralph's the one who told me about the Lord. This is an unbelievable mansion, though. I can't believe Ralph's going to live in a place like this. They continued to walk, and they turned the corner. and They finally came to this little cul-de-sac called Grace Court. Back in the end of the cul-de-sac, there was this little college, cottage rather, and it was neat and nice, but smaller than all the rest of the houses that the wealthy man had seen. And he says, who lives here? And he says, well, this is your house. He said, I can't believe that it's so small. I, I lived in a much bigger house on this earth. He said, well, sir, we've made it custom up here to build the house out of the materials and the services that you send ahead. Now, I know that's not Bible today, but it is something for us to think about. Because the Bible does say that our prayers and the tears from our prayers are stored up in heaven. And the Bible says that we are going to be judged how we live in this life. Now, that illustration is actually backed up by Scripture. The place that you will occupy in heaven reflects the faithfulness down here. It won't be able to change it there. We've already determined it down here by how we are living so as we think about the character of His coming, which is embodied in that word blessed, I hope that His coming will become for you not only a happy rapture and a happy review, three-point sermon, here it is, but I hope it will become a happy reunion. When we get to heaven, it's going to be a time of reunion and fellowship. You say, boy, I hope someone introduces me to Elijah and Moses and the Apostle Paul and Simon Peter. and you know, They start naming all these great patriarchs even in the apostolic movement. And I got to thinking about it one day. I said, you know what? I don't think we're going to need introductions. Because if it's really going to be a reunion, it's going to be a great homecoming for that first 10,000 years. The loved ones who've gone on before, the saints of all the ages, the precious souls that we've led to Christ, they will join us for a happy reunion. Brother Charles, when I was just a little boy, I used to think of heaven as this beautiful place. And, but I always thought of it as a strange place. You know? All these strangers that I don't know are going to be there. I, you know, I, I watched as people yesterday as church folk got outnumbered quick. And I watched as some people, man, they thrived in that. Walking among guests and, and I saw others were struggling because, you know, you're just not that outgoing. You struggle with that. And, and I kind of, as a boy, I kind of viewed heaven as this. Once I get to know you, I'm good. 
But if I don't know someone, I'm going to stand there and kind of try to figure them out first, you know. That's just kind of how I am. I, I try to read people. Are they, are they a jolly person or are they going to be one that I'm going to have to carry this positive part of the conversation? So you can watch things like that. And, and so as a kid, I used to think, man, heaven's going to be a beautiful place, but it's going to be a strange place of a bunch of strangers. And I, I, didn't, know, I, I didn't know anybody there, and, 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 and I wasn't just overly excited, to be honest with you, about Goldwood. I knew Jesus would be there and that would make the difference. But as a kid, you're not thinking the way we think now as adults. And then my grandfather died. And and then my grandmother on the other side died. And I began to think about all of the dear friends. And I think about people that I got close to that ended up passing on. And that happy reunion now is taking on a different sense. And heaven has kind of changed in my perspective. Yes. Even the young people who are here can think of family members and friends who have gone on. I'm beginning to think of heaven as a place of reunion and fellowship. But you know, I've said all of that and I want to mention this. The most glorious thing, while we're going to enjoy reuniting with everybody, the most glorious thing is going to be able to see Jesus face to face. You see, the truth about heaven that thrills me the most is not the streets of gold. It's not the gates of pearl or the river of life is crystal proceeding out of the throne of God or even the 12 or the the tree of life rather in the middle of heaven the walls of jasper the foundations made of sapphire the emerald the topaz the things that excite me the most about heaven is that Jesus will be there and I'm just saying that there yes there's going to be a happy reunion the main attraction though is going to be the reuniting literally of a savior with his creation Now, if the certainty of His coming is bound up in the word hope, would you throw that verse back up there one more time? And if the character of His coming is found in the word blessed, I tell you, a sermon ain't a sermon until we challenge it. So here we go. The challenging part of the second coming of Jesus Christ is the first word we read in that verse, and that is looking. There's nothing more dangerous than somebody driving not looking. Folks, this world is going fast paced. And if we're not looking for his return, we're going to miss it. The challenge for the church is for us not to get so focused on other things that we stop looking. We can settle into the easy chair, if you will. Again and again in the Bible, we're challenged. Keep watching, lest suddenly he finds us sleeping. I'm going to say that there is no more important word in our Christian vocabulary today than the word watch. So I want to ask you today, friend, are you watching? Are you looking? I don't think there's anything more criminal than not to be watching at the post of duty. Or to be sleeping at the post of duty. The Bible says, watch lest his coming suddenly finds you sleeping. What would you say about a captain who fell asleep on the deck during a storm? What would you say about the soldier who sleeps at his post of duty? What are you going to say about a night watchman who sleeps at his station? What do you think about us as Christians if we're not watching, but spending time in just a dreamy unconcern? Friend, I'm going to tell you, it is criminal. We need to be looking for that blessed hope. Now, I have one question for you. If he were to come today, would you be taken or would you be left? That's the issue. The basis of even my appeal of this Sunday morning message. You say, preacher, I feel good. Matter of fact, I went to the doctor this week. He said, I'm 100% healthy. I'm not afraid to die. I'm not worried about dying. But what if the Lord was to come back? today would you be taken to glory or would you be left behind to have to stand before the judgment of unbelievers and be consigned to a place of eternal torment that is the big issue today you see Jesus will come for you in one of two ways either you're going to meet him in death or he'll return before your death so we have to be prepared your death could happen suddenly it could happen slowly you don't know But for sure, 
we do know his return is going to happen quick. And I won't have time to call the preacher and say, come pray for me. I need the Holy Ghost. I won't have time to say, oh, open up the church house. I need to find a place to pray. He said, in a moment, in just the twinkling of an eye, the believer will be changed. This is a true story. It's in the spring of 1980. Brother Cannon's coming. I'm closing today. The blue skies above Oregon were obscured by steam and rising from St. Helens. Geologists warned an eruption was imminent. Residents living near the area were ordered to evacuate. But just like hurricanes, don't everybody listen, you know. State troopers and forest rangers, they came into the area with loudspeakers blaring, Danger! Evacuate the area immediately! Flashing road signs were erected that said, Warning, 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 evacuate immediately. 83-year-old man, no no, uh, relation to the president, by the way. This guy's name, no lie, was Harry Truman. He operates this lodge on what they called Spirit Lake, which was only five miles from Mount St. Helen. He laughed off the warnings. Officials argued with him, you got to go, man. But when he stubbornly refused, he was granted permission to stay. He said, nobody knows more about this mountain than old Harry. And he wouldn't dare blow up on me. Kind of like the Titanic, no boat can sink, ain't it? On the morning of May 18, 1980, Harry awoke and probably followed his habit of feeding his 16 cats. Fixed breakfast for himself. Time was 8.13 in the morning when Mount St. Helens exploded with the force of 23 megaton nuclear bomb. The top 1,500 feet of the mountain disappeared. The sound of the eruption was heard around 600 miles away. It's a long way. The eruption heated the air to a toasty 600 degrees. Old Harry had never heard a thing because a shock wave of energy traveling faster than the speed of sound slammed outward from the volcano. It was followed by a 50-foot tall wave of mud and dirt that flattened everything within 150 square miles. It destroyed over half a million trees. The eruption was followed by a cloud of ash that covered everything to a depth of 50 feet. They never found a trace of Harry, his cats, or his cabin. I wonder what went through old Harry's mind in that millisecond that he had gambled with his life and lost. He had heard the warnings, but he did not heed them. All that remains from Harry's life now is a sermon illustration of his refusal to heed the warning. Fifty feet above the remaining molecules of Harry's incinerated remains, there's a crooked path named Harry's Trail. My advice today is after hearing that story, don't follow Harry's Trail. The Bible says at any moment, the Lord can return in just a flash or in the twinkling of an eye. Would you stand with me today? God has placed warning signs all along the road. Warning! Repent immediately! This message is not just another warning. For those of us who have heeded this warning and put our faith in the Lord, been born again of water and spirit, repenting of our sins, being baptized in Jesus' name, being infilled with His Spirit, evidenced by speaking in tongues, we escape that judgment against sin. But some people like old Harry just laugh at the Bible. They refuse to hear and heed to the warning of God. This pastor stands in this pulpit today pleading you, don't be like Harry. I don't want to live in careless unconcern. I don't want to act like people around me don't know what they're talking about. I also don't want to be like so many church members who seem to hold the second coming as a doctrine, but not as a hope. I want to be like those who love His appearing. It's like... I get home a lot of times from if it's a regular work day especially on let's just say Tuesday night for example a lot of times I don't get to eat supper Tuesday night and Wednesday night it's a special occasion if I actually get down and eat supper with the family the way schedules are with prayer meeting and church and all this 
But a lot of times when I come home on Tuesday night after prayer meeting, we've drove in separate vehicles if little guy hadn't wore himself out and fell asleep on the way home. I'll walk through the garage door and I'll walk into the kitchen. Usually my wife's either standing there fixing them a snack or has just finished them a snack and is working on us something to eat. And I can look around the corner from the kitchen and there's our living room. And right there at the corner of the living room, we still argue about whose chair it is. But there's a recliner, real comfy recliner that sits there. Matthew will go and climb up in that recliner and he's learned he could stand up on his tiptoes. Hold on to the top of that recliner and all you see is about from here up of his head looking for dad to come in that door. Hey, daddy. Yeah, hey, buddy. Next thing I know, if I don't hurry and get to that chair, he's coming up on top of the chair. He's not thinking the same way you got up there, get down, come around. No, he's quickest way I can get to dad. This is the way that I view the church. We know he's coming. We just don't know exactly when. But we got to be watching, anticipating, standing on our spiritual tiptoes, if you will, ready for His return. It's the greatest hope that we have. Yes, we believe when you give, the Lord blesses you back. When you sow into the kingdom, God sows into your life. But that's not the greatest hope of the church. Yes, we believe in in, in reaching everybody and getting involved in our communities. But that's not the greatest hope in the church. For the Bible says you've got to be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. What is that hope that's inside of you? That is, I'm looking for the Lord's return. And I'm going to be able to tell somebody how to make sure that they too can go with me. The greatest hope in the church is going to be the resurrection and the reuniting with God with his church. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for this day that you've given us. We've had no excuses not to come to church today as it has been a blessed day, a beautiful day on the outside. But today we're reaching for hearts and we're reaching for souls today that need you. We're reaching, oh God, in an anticipation knowing that you could come back this very afternoon And God, we want those that need the baptism of the Holy Ghost to be filled. We want those, oh Lord, that need to get their heart right with you and even maybe some other ways. Maybe us as Christians, we've we've let things grow in our lives that we want to get rid of that we know would keep us from making heaven our home. I pray today, God, that you would help us even as a church, not just to look at it as a doctrine, but Lord, to truly live our lives, that this is the greatest thing that's ever going to happen to us. That's not being filled with the Holy Ghost. The greatest thing that's ever going to happen to us is when we meet you face to face help us today I pray in Jesus name amen amen if you want to make heaven your home I want you to step out from where you are today and let's find ourselves a place to pray if you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost we believe God can fill you join with somebody the Bible says where two agree on earth as teaching any one thing that it shall be done agree with somebody if you see someone that needs the spirit of God and you want to pray with them men with men ladies with ladies let's do that today it is with the purpose of the church to lead others to Christ. Let's see God do a great work in lives in this building today. If you're praying for yourself, ask God, help me today, Lord, as a part of your church, to see the second coming as more than just a doctrine, but I want to see it as the hope that lies inside of me today. In Jesus' name.